know you're as excited to hear poetry. I, I don't know if Brian Freeland is here, but if not, he should be because we're going to talk poetry today. And um, but I'm also pretty open to have questions and you can come on camera to and speak or you can do the chat. But to be honest, somebody's going to have to tell me there is a question. OK, um, but so please, I, I'd like this to be as interactive as possible. So I I love William Butler Yeats. I'm not a big poetry person, which makes it really weird that I love William Butler Yeats because he's a poet. Um, he's also a playwright. He's an essayist. But for me, um, he connected to, to my roots as an Irish woman, a Celtic woman. And the three things he writes about, the three big things, he writes about the, the ancient Irish kings and then the mythic pseudo-historic uh, heroes of Ireland. Um, there is some evidence in Ireland that that the, the the mythic figures are actually real people, but we don't know how much of the stuff is actually real. He writes about the Druids and the Bards, and just this will tell you why I like Yeats so much. Um, Yeats was pretty well out there, kind of like me, right? And he he was a spiritualist, so he believed, literally believed, he was a reincarnation of one of the Bards from the Druid Age. And so, um, and, I, and I mean, literally believed he was a, a reincarnation of the bard. And he felt that his poetry was um, was a, a, a something for him to see when he came back um, in his next life. He'd find it as kind of a key to what his old life's work was, right? So that's Yeats. You can see why I really like him now. He also wrote about the Irish landscape. And all three of these topics, the mythic Irish heroes and kings, the Druids and the bards and the Irish land landscape can be collapsed into the Irish landscape because all of these have representation in the Irish landscape. And so in order to do good research on any of these topics, including AIDS, you have to go to Ireland. And let me show you what I mean by that. Okay, yucky picture, but here we go. Oh, look at I'm wearing the same, same sweater too. Embarrassing. So in Ireland, um, the landscape is dotted with connections to the history and the myth of Ireland. So for instance, all over Ireland, you're gonna see passage tombs, which is where I'm standing in. I'm standing in a passage tomb, and I'll tell you a funny story about that in a few minutes. And then there's the standing stones. So any of you who have watched Outlander, dang, let me tell you, go to Ireland, there's a lot of standing stones and stone circles. And here's why they're still standing in Ireland. So the Irish believe that when the modern Irish came to the island, the old Celtic pantheon went underground. They went to the other world and they're just waiting for their time to come back and reclaim the, the island. And the passage tombs are the ways to the underworld, to the other world, and the stone circles can get you there in a different way. So even if you don't believe it as an Irish person, you wouldn't dare knock down any of these Neolithic structures just in case. So what we think as the fairies, right? We have this concept of the fairies twittering around. That's not at all what the Irish think of fairies. The fairies are the old Celtic pantheon, right? They live underneath the passage tombs and the standing stones. And so that's why doing research on any of the writers of Ireland requires you to go to the landscape. You have to go, right? So let me tell you a funny story about what APUS has made happen for me. So I decided that one of the things I needed to do in the last, the last time I was on the research grant was to go to what all Irish mythic heroes had done. They had gone to an, an, a tomb, a passage tomb called the Cave of Cats, which is the entrance to hell. Now you might have thought that's probably someplace she should have avoided. And you would be, you would be so right. What, what happens is the Cave of Cats is still exists and it's on a farmer's land in the middle of Roscommon. And I mean, literally, it's on the middle of the farmer's land. It's a hole in the ground, right? And you can buy tickets that goes to the farmer and you can go in the, the Cave of Cats. And I thought, being American, that they would have all, all kinds of safety features. Nope. Nope. You sit down at the top of the hole and you slide into the cave. You go straight down for a long while on wet stone all the way down to the bottom. 
And then you, at, when you're there, the only thing you have is a, a flashlight, a torch, they say. Everybody tur- turns their torches off and you stand in the darkness. And, and the idea of a passage tune is that you stay there all night in that complete and utter darkness in the womb of the earth, right? This is why you become a mythic hero because you are reborn as a new person when you leave the tomb, if you can ever find your way out. And literally, you cannot, you can't see your hand in front of your face. You, you lose the ability to know what's up or down. It's just crazy. And so that's kind of the things that I was able to do because of the APUS grant. One of the oldest structures in the world is, is in Ireland. Um, in Irish, it's called the Brun the Boy. And in, in English, we call it Newgrange. It is at least a thousand years older than Stonehenge and 500 years older than the Great Pyramid and the Sphinx. So you can see that these structures are really old. And that's why it's important to go to Ireland to do the studies. By the time Yeats is writing his most famous works, the Irish had been subjugated by the English for 700 years. And I know subjugated is a heavy word. But in Ireland for a few centuries, you weren't allowed to speak Irish or you were killed. You weren't allowed to go to to school if you were Irish or you could be killed. You weren't allowed to practice your faith as as a Catholic. And you certainly weren't allowed to talk about the Celtic faith. You weren't allowed to intermarry. You weren't allowed to own a horse. You weren't allowed to own land. Um, all of these things could result in murder. And the idea was that they were trying to, to create the conditions where the Irish would forget that they were Irish. But they were too good at it. The British were too good at it. And so the Irish never fully integrated into a British society, right? They were just, they were not citizens. They were were more like chattel. And so by the time Yeats was writing his most favorite things, there was this resurgence of Irishness, right? So Yeats was writing about being Irish. Yeats was Anglo. So his family came to Ireland at the Norman Conquest 700 years earlier. And even though he had been there for 700 years, not Yeats, but his family, he was still considered Anglo. So he could get away with a lot more than the Irish could. He and Lady Gregory opened up the National Theater, the Abbey Theater in, in Dublin. And, um, oops, sorry. And you, it's still there. And you might think National Theater, cool. Except think about it as a, a British man in the early 1900s. Whose nation are you celebrating at the National Theater? It was treason. It was treason to open the National Theater. They got away with it because they were Anglo. And then they wrote plays that added sedition on top of their treason of opening a national theater. Kathleen Lee Houlihan is one of the famous ones. She, Kathleen, is the allegory for Ireland and she's fighting the British Empire. Now they never say Ireland, they never say Great Britain, but it's very clear. And she goes about the countryside rounding up the young men to fight for their freedom. So they're in a treasonous building acting out sedition on the stage. And and then just for the heck of it, Yates joined the Irish Republican Brotherhood. The IRB was a secret society, treasonous, because Republican is in the true sense here what it means. They wanted to be separate. They wanted to be a republic that was um, wholly uh, owned by uh, the Irish people and not by Britain. So again, it was sedition. It was treason. And, you know, it, our man Yates here, he did the secret society stuff and then told everybody he knew he was kind of safe. So while Yates was out there writing his most famous stuff, right, um, he was doing it to reintroduce Irishness as culture, as literature, as, you know, bagpipes came back, there was the harp came back, hurling as a sport came back, Irish as a language came back during this time. He did not mean it, though as a political thing. But you know what? The Irish were listening. And so as Celtic revitalization was being pumped out by these writers, these creatives, people were reclaiming their Irishness. They were reclaiming it. They were comfortable speaking about it again and telling their stories. 
and they didn't have to speak in code anymore because now the famous writers were writing about it and Yates was winning all kinds of awards for it. And so they could be Irish again. And the Republicans acted on Yates's words. So rather than seeing it as a revitalization of culture and literature, the Republicans saw it as a call to arms. And what they and 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 here's the crazy thing. There was a group of seven in 1916 who took over Dublin, right? Declared independence from Britain, and within a week were smashed to smithereens. Four of the seven, four were poets. Four were poets, right? And one played the bagpipes. So these were creatives who were going out and, and using Yeats's words to create a political revolution. Well, they were smashed by the British Empire. But the British made their biggest mistake of, in the 700 years. And that was they put those men to death. And the sentiment in the country turned in favor of republicanism. Okay. And one of the people that were, was part of the 1916 uprising was a man named Michael Collins. Now, you might know him, maybe not, but Michael Collins um, was born in the South in Cork, and um, he created the Irish Republican Army. Now, you know the IRA today probably more as a terrorist organization, but at this time it was legitimately a, an army, and it and I'll tell you why it splintered off into an, another form later on. But Michael Collins was also a writer. He was from, he, and he loved Yeats. He read Yeats and he read Whitman. He carried a copy of Whitman's Leaves of the Grass wherever he went. And um, Michael Collins um, ran for election to sit in the British Parliament for the party Sinn Féin, which you probably have heard too. And all it means is ourselves alone. Again, another act of sedition, right? And they won overwhelmingly. And instead of sitting in the parliament, they said, we're not going to sit in the parliament of Britain. We're going to open our own. And they did. <laughs> so another act of treason, Michael Collins was elected as the minister of finance and also the director of intelligence, adding a little more sedition, a little more sedition, a little more sedition. And so I was able through this grant to go down to county court and live among Michael Collins' family, go through his personal effects, read his letters, read his, his journal, talk to the people, not who knew him, right? At this point, it's grandnephews and all, um, but get a real sense for who Michael Collins was. And, um, and so I, as the research was taking over, I, I was also writing about what I was finding out about Yates. So I, I presented. So part of my job as an, a, a, a recipient of the of the research grant is to give back to the university in terms of publication, right? So I presented at the College English Association, at, and you can see up here in the corner, in the Deep Hearts Core, Latent Irishness at the Heart of Yates, Yeats's seminal work. And I just, like, I just want to tell you just a little bit. So Yeats's most famous work was called The Lake Island of Inishry. I will arise now and go and go to Inishfree and on, on a small cabin build there of clay and water smithing, right? It was all code. He was using the landscape to talk about the mythic heroes of Ireland. Inishfree is a little tiny, less than a mile island that sits in the middle of the coast and off the coast. And um, it's known for being the place where the gods and goddesses of the old Celtic pantheon got their food. So everybody knew what he was doing when he was writing the Lake Isle of Inishbury. We think of it as a kind of nice little, isn't that a nice little thing? But he was using the, the landscape to talk about sedition, right? <laughs> like he was doing exactly what the British government killed the Irish for doing. So that's what I talked about at the College English Association. Then I published in a Johns Hopkins University Press, the CEA Critic. And it was an orchestrated awakening, latent Irishness at the heart of Yeats' seminal work. And as I was presenting and writing about Yeats, I also started to research and write while I was down in County Cork about Michael Collins, right? So I, I finished a historical novel a few months ago. And then you can't make up the timing. This morning it was accepted for publication. So today's rain makes tomorrow's whiskey will be out by the 
by mid 2020, by mid 2025. And um, they're going to rush it because there's connections to the Israeli Palestinian um, conversation that we're having now. So that is the research that I do and continue to do. I would love to talk more about this with you guys with questions. If you're, if you're wondering, how do you sustain a research project? How do you, you know, how do you conceive of it? How do you continue it from year to year? How do you build a passion for it? Or just if you're interested in knowing something cool or quirky or weird about Ireland or me, I'm happy to share. This is such a wonderful forum to be able to share with, with you guys, my colleagues. Hi, Susan. Oh, come on. You have to ask questions. There's so many questions. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Jackie. And, and as you were speaking, you know, there's so, there's clearly so much to talk about. There's so much depth and richness to the things that you're researching. I'm particularly interested in, you said you spent time with, was it Michael Collins' family? Yeah. Yeah. Going through his personal effects as well. Did you have any like crazy aha moments as you were going through those? Many, many crazy aha moments. And um, just let me tell you that in 2022, I believe 2022 was, I think my first research grant where I went to Ireland and I, I, I was asked to read at a literary festival in County Cork. So that's where I started. And I was staying at an Airbnb. And <laughs> when I got home from presenting that day, the lady who owned the farm, I was staying in a little little cottage on her farm. She came running out the door and she said, I saw you on the telly. I saw you on the telly. I saw you on the telly. I was like, yeah, I read. And she said, and, and you're right about Michael Collins. Yeah, I do research on Michael Collins. And she said, his nephew lives next door. Would you like to meet him? His nephew, okay, now, now go with me here because this is Ireland. So his nephew lived next, lives next door. Do you want to meet him? I said, I would love to. She said, well, he died last May, right? But his son still lived there. Do you want to go over and meet him? So I did. I went over and meet him, and they invited me to come back the following, when it, well, whenever I could get back and to go through their great uncle's stuff. And I, like, what are the chances of that happening? What are the chances? And so I wrote this, the next one and was able to go back. Um, not only did I go for the research grant, but then I spent six weeks. I, I went again for six weeks and stayed there in the farmhouse. And the things that you, like you, you don't think about when you're writing a historical novel, like the names of the kids that his nieces and nephews that he used to play soccer with or um, the the the, the grandnephew told me a story of the, the British were looking for Michael Collins and when they couldn't find him, they decided to take it out on his family. So they went down to County Cork and they, they torched his childhood homestead with his 13 nieces and nephews living inside. And, um, and so they told me the story of that night, which appears in, in the new novel, right? It, it's that kind of stuff that you, you just can't get from doing research. You, you have to go. You have to talk to the people. You have to, you have to see the house. You have to, you have to put your hand on the charred remains of where those children were sleeping. You, you, and that's what this this grant enables me to do is to to really dig down. And there's other things too. Um, there is research I would never ever have been able to get online or through a library, like to for, for I'm a like I'm a kind of pacifist so. When they put his Webley gun in my hand, like there was, that's like to be able to write about something that you've held in your hand, like the, that I know the weight of, that I can tell you how it fit in my hand, that I could tell you how the, the barrel at the top of the barrel was scratched. And I, I don't know why, but I asked and the grand nephew told me that they had, they, because he was hunted all over Dublin by the British, he pretended he he just he went around on a bicycle all the time and so the british thought he was just a working guy and he would get on the tram and in order to to not get caught he would hide the gun above the tram like in the 
the wall, the ceiling of the tram. And so from pushing it back, it scratched the barrel. I would never have known that. There was nowhere that I would have found that if I had not been there physically to get it. There was so much, Kelsey, I could tell you so much. Um, but I, I found out that he <laughs> he loved um, uh, Blue Terriers um, and he he entered one in a British dog show and won first place. And what he did was he gave the dog the number, his prison number from after the 1916 uprising. So, I mean, he was bold. He was in their faces. He was, he was right there. And those things you don't know unless you're there. You just, you'd never know unless you read my book now. Jackie, this is Barb Cliff and I do have a question. Number one, thank you for your presentation. Your passion for the topic really, really shows. My question for you is, was there anything or is there anything that you wish you would have included in your research proposal that looking back you wish you would have included and didn't? You know, Barbara, that's a really great question. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look at that through the back door. So I wrote the original proposal for last year, I believe, um, to start in, in Sligo, where Yates is from, and then go down to County Cork, which is significant different distance. And um, because of the just coming out of COVID, the cost of movement in Ireland skyrocketed. It was out outrageous. And I then I called Jennifer Douglas then and I said, I, I can't. I, I can't do this. Like I, I, what I budgeted for it, it like it'll double. And she said, if you're going to do the research that you said you're going to do, that's fine. Like you don't have to, if you can't get to Sligo, don't go to Sligo, just do your research in the South. And so I feel like I was given the okay to follow where the research took me. Right. So do I wish I've never looked at the proposal since I wrote it and turned it in. Does that make sense? Because of that moment. So there may have been things I could have included that I didn't because I got the okay to, because to, who knows where the research is going to go, right? I never thought I was going to write a book on Michael Collins. I thought I was going to show how Yates's words had affected him. And Yates appears in the book, but not as he's, he bumps in. Collins bumps into him in the middle of Dublin, a Dublin street, right? Like, And so we know that Yates was there. We know how he used to walk around the streets of Dublin. We know where he was. We know that that Collins knew him um, because of Yates's great love, Maud Gong. He knew Maud Gong. So we knew that there was a possibility that that, but you know, like that's where Yates, that's it. That's all Yates appears in the Michael Collins book. So I think for the, the answer to your question is, I didn't feel I needed to include everything because I had the freedom to, to go where the research took me. Thanks, Jackie. I have a question, Jackie. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I don't know if this makes sense. How do you navigate um, some people who might be sensitive to portraying English in an, the English in a negative light? And the reason I ask that is, um, you know, the U.S. has a lot of cultural connections to, to England. Yeah. And I'll say, as someone who was not raised quote English culturally or whatever. I didn't know a lot of the history of Ireland or um, <laughs> the empire and how the empire treated many of its lands. And recently um, having made friends with somebody who's born in India, th the people in India have a completely different view of the English than the yeah. English maybe view quote, ah, back when we had an empire. Um, you're asking the wrong person here because <laughs> so I grew up with like, so let me just tell you, my grandfather um, was kicked out of County Cork when he was 12 for being a Republican. Um, and he always, I mean, my grandfather was not a great man. It might've been the best thing that County Cork ever did, but, um, but the British kicked him out because he was siding with the Republicans. And my, I heard the stories of Michael Collins from the time I was a little girl. My son is named Collins. So hmm. like, um, so I grew up with a healthy hatred of the British. And so for me, it's the it's how to get to the worst of what they did 
and still humanize them, right? Like it's not an effective story if you're like, if you're dealing with demons, it's like they're demons, right? But if you're dealing with human beings and how could they possibly do this to other human beings, then, then that, that's, that's the way I, I look at it, right? So in the odd ending to your question is that today your books offered, they called and offered I, to, to buy the book and they're based in London. So I think they know the tragedy that they caused. So I think, I don't know. I don't know how to answer that. I, I don't. Tim asked a question I want to address. He asked how it, uh, how the the fight for freedom in Ireland is equal to the, or mirrors the, the fight in Israel and Palestine right now. And what you should know is that the same people who wrote the, the policies in Ireland at the turn of the century are the same exact people who wrote the policies for Palestine after World War I. And so that's how it mirrors so incredibly. It's the it's the same people. They use the same policies. They never even change the wording. And so even though it's done in two different places with two different peoples, it's part of a British, it's the British Empire on two different. And and, and so it, there's a lot, there's a lot of mirror. Like if you, I, I don't bring it out in the book, of course, because it's not the goal of the book, but if you know the other story, if you know the story of Palestine, for instance, you'll see that that story all again in, in the Michael Collins book. So that's why it has relevance now. It's the same people. I, I want to thank APUS in general and Kelsey and Michelle for the opportunities they give me to really seriously nerd out. Um, it is, it is like so wonderful to, to be able to do this kind of research. It, it keeps me powered for the rest of the year, truly. And this year I'm actually starting a new historical novel. Um, so it's, <laughs> and it's a weird one, man. It's on Yates. This time Yates is the, one of the key characters. Um, but, but, um, I, I don't even know how you can see how excited and how passionate I am about it. And I, I, I couldn't have done it by myself. So, and I would encourage anyone who has this kind of passion, do, do it, take the chance, do it. Thank you so much, Jackie. It's one of, I'm, <laughs> it's one of my great pleasures to be able to platform people to nerd out, to talk about everything that they have going on. I really appreciate your passion on this subject and I'm a humanities person at heart. So it's, it's such a treat to see how this grant gets to, gets to support you traveling and doing that humanities work. Thank you. I mean, anyone who sees my pictures on, so pictures of my children, pictures of my parents and a picture of Yates and on, on my bookshelf, right? So there's a picture of Yates down on my piano, right? Come on, man. Who's that nerd? <laughs> So, well, thank you so much, Jackie. And thanks everybody for your thank questions. You thank you. Come with me.